and we're now we're now recording as well for posterity. So, who, who what do you guys think of Java 8? Is it going to change the world? <laughs> uh, sure, yes, of course Hi. it will, absolutely. My name is Mark uh, The funny Chief thing is, is uh, you know, as an app server guy, we just started using Java closer 7. To your mouth. We just started using it's Java 7. So the app servers tend to be like, Java. have to go a the major, introduction of Lambda expressions you know, and the version behind. API to the Java uh, standard so edition we'll, 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 we'll see it'll, it'll change the world a year from now. It'll change the world for you guys and we'll catch up like the next release. We have enabled the creation of more powerful APIs, which in turn can improve Yeah, I think that's quite optimistic. I'd probably say more like about maybe two, two and a half years, maybe. Um, yeah, I suspect. Uh, this is, of course, about more than worse than Lambda. It also includes a new and vastly improved state improved API. The Nosworn JavaScript that's, interpreter that's Mark built from the ground up with JVM features and a completely open source JavaFX API. Yes. And a modernized. That's entertaining. And run on a wider range of hardware and hardware than ever before. <laughs> That's probably coming from my laptop like that. Which are yeah. Well defined subsets of the platform, the smallest of which fits into just 11 megabytes of memory. Yeah. And is ideal. Yes, he is. This is live. For even smaller devices, and in particular. Let me let me refresh Mark. Mark Mark needs to be refreshed every now and then. Release <laughs> Java Micro Edition 8. See if that's better for sound. Upgrade brings modern language features and APIs to the Java ME platform, yet retains the ability to fit an implementation into just a few hundred kilobytes. Yeah. In the next hour, we'll learn more about Java 8 from key members of the Java community, right. both inside and outside of Oracle. To get started, let's speak with some oh, of the principal architects responsible for the new features All right, so identify the Java panel. Who, who do you recognize? <laughs> I'm joined here today by Brian Getz, Brian Getz. Bob Vendette, Roger Riggs, Rich Baer, and John Rose. Uh, so, Brian. So I think we're being outclassed with their panel doing, versus ours. Okay, so my name is Brian. But they don't have beer. We have beer. Architect. So that's and that's that's a winning factor, years, right? I've been working on the core uh, <laughs> language and library features for Java 8, uh, including Lambda expressions, default methods, and the new Streams API for. Uh, aggregate and data parallel queries over collections. And together, these, uh, these features work together to um, enable us to write more expressive, readable, maintainable performant code for the things that we work on every day. And also, they're just a lot of fun to use. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, I've, been, I've had the luxury of working with these new features for the last year and a half now. And I got to say, once you, once you try it, you're not going to want to go back. It's a lot yeah, of fun. I that's that's a member joining our Hangout. We have, <laughs> I, a, I mention, we have a live Hangout. We're going to show some so of those folks in a sec as well please, uh, tweet from to the different hashtag, parts of the world. Not uh, quite as large crowds as here, though. And uh, if they're good questions, we'll take them. And uh, if not, we'll come up with others. <laughs> OK, Bob. Hey, Mark. My name is Bob Van Dett. I'm the uh, technical lead of the Java SE embedded product team here at Oracle. Uh, my team's been driving the implementation of the compact profiles into JDK 8 in order to enable embedded developers to target smaller devices. Embedded developers have, are very sensitive to costs when they design their solution. And as a result, they don't want to carry around packages and APIs that they don't need for their application. This is, this is your area, right, Garrett? Embedded, the to that embedded Java? We've defined three specified subsets of yes. the APIs. So you're hacking on embedded Java, Java all the time. Eight. While maintaining the no, language no, features, a lot of the time so you get to no, use no, the new language so is features Bob, is Bob your hero? in a much smaller package. I don't okay. know him. <laughs> Roger. Hi, my name is Fred Riggs. So, um, I've been working to help integrate the date, new date and time into yeah, JDK 8, I'm, I'm at working with Java Steve Coburn and the JSR 310 the expert group. Right? The new yeah. API is a there sort of a comprehensive new API to essentially replace the existing ones that are very long in the tooth. It provides very concrete, strongly typed. Excellent. APIs, what's your, what's your, your favorite routes, embedded board now? Multiple calendars, regional calendars, as well it. as the standard ISO 8601 global speaker, business calendar. So. And it's got all that extensibility points, what? so if oh, your yeah, application is something a little board, bit different, sorry. it's easy so to it's, integrate. Uh, my mm -hmm. favorite embedded board is uh, based on an yeah. IMX. Rich Bear, I'm a uh, Java client architect, at the moment, and uh, the stuff that we've been working on with Java client for the last couple years, a lot of work on performance. Okay, let's see what Rich mentioned in the intro. There's a new theme for JavaFX and 8, which is is really nice. Um, we've also been working on getting integration into Java, so that the normal Java launcher will launch JavaFX apps as well as um, you know everything else yeah. seamlessly. Um, it's sitting there on the class path. Any yeah. FX app that you write will just run. Uh, a lot of work in 3D, new features, new UI controls, a lot of new things going into into Java client. 
things. John? I'm John Rose, and I'm the JVM architect. I work on bytecode features for the JVM, the, 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 the uh, underlayment that uh, seamlessly and performantly supports all the other features. Um, hopefully, it doesn't get noticed much, but of course, we're always working on performance and have an eight, and also some wonderful new features like um, adding uh, support for dynamic languages in specifically NASHorn, the JavaScript interpreter, and then removing features like permgen, which actually required a lot of work. Yeah. Perm gen. About that one. Yeah, the perm okay, gen so let's start with a, a question that came in uh, on Twitter a few days ago, um, uh, and of course, uh, we, we've heard this before, so this is a softball, Brian. An app Aren't Lambda's and just triggered for that app in and classes? Then eventually well, they could have, right, we could have chosen to go that way, and in some sense that would have been easier way to do it, but in a lot of ways that, I think, was taking the easy way out. If we had just said, Lambda's are just going to be sugar for inner classes, then we would have inherited all of the complexity of inner classes. And so, so, so Java EE developers so are going to migrate like droves just oh, to get totally, started in. Totally. Yeah. 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 To yeah. I, I would recommend options. everybody well, uh, without give identity. that a shot as soon as and their app servers update their ASM version to support it. it. Uh, yeah, to definitely try that out. Uh, there are fewer sharp corners, but also the way it is, probably 80% of the, the um, like performance tuning companies are out of business. I mean, this is what they do. To illustrate that. Even in the first version, where the performance hasn't been, you know, the, the the primary goal, going out the door, Lambda expression performance compared to inner classes is as good as or better than across the board um, than inner classes, whether it be on linkage performance, capture performance, invocation performance. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we've um, we could we could have we could have done it that way, but what we did I think was uh, simpler, better, and is. Uh, is going to lead to opportunities in the future to make it even better. Mm -hmm. So a related question about performance is, um, you know, people often lo look at the at the, the sort of introductory examples of, you know, here's a for loop external iteration, you know, turn that into a, into a use of the of the streams API. Do, should people be nervous about using the streams API in place of a for loop, which you know, they already know is is going to be pretty fast? Yeah, they, they, they shouldn't be nervous about it, right? I mean, you, w whenever it comes to uh, analyzing or measuring or theorizing about performance, uh, you know, th there's always lots of caveats. It, it depends on everything. You know, uh, performance measurement on under dynamic compilation is a compl complicated subject. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, you know, we, we've, we've been looking at the performance of streams pipelines compared to handwritten for loops. And what we're seeing is that you know most of the time the performance is comparable to the handwritten code. Sometimes it's better than the handwritten code. Um, so uh, you know I think that just supports the advice that we've been giving people for years, which is write code that's simple, clean, maintainable, correct, and the performance very often just takes care of itself. Right. And if it doesn't, you figure out the problem later. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay. So another question we had from from Twitter, and I, I think this is one for you, John, is how how does how does Lambda relate to Project Sumatra? And, and using GPUs from Java. It seems like there, are, there ought to be a connection there, right? Yes, there is. Well, um, as you might remember, Mark, we, we uh, spent so much effort and time on Lambda so that we could get to multi-core. And Sumatra is the pushing of the multi-core vision out to the modern uh, heterogeneous uh, coprocessor hardware that, uh, that's not just for, your, um, for running Quake or what, whatever the current video games are. Um, I'm dating myself. What we, want to, <laughs> what we want to be able to do is run um, thousands of threads on these specialized thread, thread machines that do uh, vector processing very well. And in order to do that, we have to reformulate our loops radically. We can't write for, for loops anymore and expect them to be optimized on this new hardware. So um, being able to, uh, to emit and co-generate streams code from, from lambdas onto this new hardware is, is necessary. And the Sumatra project is our um, is our cutting edge um, work to, with AMD to make this happen on uh, on on various kinds of, of heterogeneous. Oh, oh no 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 Simon Simon. Okay. We uh, we let's have you. Turn to a question about, uh, about your your fellow compatriot has so you covered. There, there are three compact profiles, sort of like 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 la layers of an of an onion or something. How does a developer know, you know, given on some body of code, which compact profile to use? You just guess. Uh, of course not. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. for embedded developers to really leverage the compact profiles, they have to break apart any dependencies they might have in order to use the smallest profile that fits their needs. We've enhanced a couple of tools in order to make that job a little easier. If you have the source to, to your program, so we've enhanced Java C with a profile option that will allow Java C to target a specific <laughs> profile and warn you of uses of packages that are not in a specific profile. 
if you only have a jar file, we have enhanced, it actually added a new tool called JDEPS, and it has a profile option that will let it, re it will report the package that, that the jar file requires, and you can throw another option to actually get the per class report of which methods you're even using. So with those two tools, um, it'll make it a lot easier for you, for you to find out where the dependencies are and target smaller profiles. In addition, IDEs you like using compact profiles on your devices, Garrett. Capabilities, so it can warn you while you're developing no, software. No, only the, the full-blown <laughs> thing. So no compact profiles so far. So another question we had was, uh, all right. how, how because I would like to use JavaFX on that thing. So. Do so you want the whole? You want the whole? I would like all. to have the whole thing. Three <laughs> profiles, compact one, two, and three, and and they can be viewed as a poor man's jigsaw, right? There are three well, modules. Because the compact profiles don't include any you know, UI, do they? So if you're going to do any UI, you need. You can't use compact profiles. Um, but in Jigsaw, we're planning on actually having a module called Compact 1, Compact 2, and Compact 3. So, so that if you write code to target a specific compact profile, you can pick a module and have it run out of the box. Um, but you can obviously you know, leverage the Jigsaw you know, modules that are even smaller than compact profiles. And in the future, you'll be able to pick you know, more fine-grained subsets. Right. to target specific sets of, of modules. Yeah, well, it'll have, <coughs> have a lot more flexibility. Exactly. Cool. OK, so, so Rich, JavaFX 8 is now completely open source, right? Correct. So what is your favorite other open source project related? It's a good question. All right, so who, who, there, who there, likes the fact that JavaFX is open source? I'm looking at Give a big round of applause if you like open source JavaFX. And he is actually one of the early adopters of Java. I know, so I know you're a big open source fan. That must make you happy, Dave. Time. I like it. And he comes from an Eclipse background. Good move. And so move. the things that he's been <laughs> focusing on is providing tooling for Eclipse developers, which is nice. So if you're doing FX on Eclipse, you definitely want to use his project. But in the last, um, I, I think, month, he had another project that he's been working on, which is to port SWT to run on top of JavaFX. Yeah, I, I saw the demo of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's impressive. It's, it's really cool. And, and in fact, with the new theme that we had in JavaFX 8, it looks really good. And so um, I've been very excited as he's been working on that. And, and uh, yeah, that's, it's just really cool. It's really cool to see that kind of adoption and, and things moving on top of FX. Um, there's another project, though, that I have been keeping an eye on called ReactFX. Mm -hmm. So you may be aware of the whole reactive extensions that uh, programming trend that's been going yep. on. And um, he's, he's taken an API and built it on top of the binding system that we had in JavaFX um, and created some really nice Lambda-based tooling, based, or uh, APIs that run on top of JavaFX that let you do some really powerful things um, in very concise code that, uh, you know, correctly. It's, it's just really powerful stuff. So I've been keeping my eye on that project, mm -hmm. ReactFX. I've been very interested to try it out for real. Yeah, it looks, it looks like fun. So Roger, Dayton time. It's been sort of a long, sad story <laughs> you know, for, for the, 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 the entire life of the platform. Uh, it seems like we, we finally have something that's actually real and usable. Um, I was wondering, wondering what, what calendars are actually supported in it? Well, and uh, so the, the obvious one is the uh, International ISO 8601, mm -hmm. the global business calendar. But it also supports the Japanese calendar, Thai Buddhist, Monongo, and uh, the Islamic calendar, which is is new in JDK 8. OK. And, and is it extensible if somebody wanted to, to come in and add their own mumble mumble calendar? Oh, yeah. And, and we'll probably add some calendars in the future. There's a specific part of the API which is delegated to, uh, dedicated to extensibility of calendars. There's a, a set of fields and types. And it's easy to install a new calendar just using the service loader. Mm -hmm. So it can be a, you know, per application if need be. Right. Now, th this was actually a major contribution from outside. Can you tell us a bit about, uh, about where, who, who, who did this and, and, and the, the process of getting it in? Right. So most of, all the credit for getting it started has to go with Steve Coburn. He started, he's been working on calendar app, APIs probably in for 15 or 20 years, and his earlier project was John Tone. It's pretty well received in a lot of business, uh, businesses that use it. Uh, he started uh, initially JSR 3.10 about five years ago. It's been through some ups and downs. We get Oracle and I got involved uh, about a year and a half ago to help bring it into JDK 8 because we realized its potential and the need, need for it to be in the JDK. So we, I've been working closely with, with Stephen and uh, he's provided the sort of the motive force and the integrity of the API and getting into the JDK. Yeah, that's no, a great piece of work. 
And, yeah. and there was also some help, I think, from the London Java community in getting the PCK tests done. Uh, <laughs> yep. We had All right, our, our local the... LJC panelist yeah, is yeah, now so been honored. Good work. So, so 310, the daytime API, massive amounts of work came from the LJC, the London Java community. And, it, and it's awesome to see uh, communities. I'm a massive community person, so it's awesome to see Java members, Java communities really making an impact on the future of Java. Um, two shout outs, Richard Warburton um, and, and James Goff. Really, really awesome in, in actually making changes to the API. And that's thanks to Adopt JSR. All right. Yeah, I got to say, from someone who's been in the JCP like almost 10 years, it was kind of astonishing to see that JSR. Uh, progress and it even had some hard times at times, but you got there in the end. And it's like a little milestone. One of the first JSRs that's like people individual driven to completion. That's a that's a huge milestone. For yeah. The well, there are a lot of individuals who contributed. I remember talking with Stephen, and he was completely burnt out <laughs> towards the end of the implementation. <laughs> it's a huge milestone. I hope you see more of it. That happen, and so uh, I think the best example of, of that, and, and with lambdas, is has to do with uh, you know two language features that are both individually complex, and that most people don't even notice until something goes wrong, which is type inference and method overload selection. So these are both uh, areas of the specification that are really complicated but that users don't necessarily perceive themselves to be working with until they get an error message of, you know, from the compiler about uh, having done the wrong thing and then they don't know why. And, and uh, when, when, in order to, uh, to, to, to do lambdas you know, right uh, in, in such a way that you just wrote the obvious code and it worked, we had to completely overhaul both of these features and their interactions. And so basically rip them apart, put them back together uh, so that people can write code the way they expect and have it work mm -hmm. without running into weird generic error messages and things like that. Yeah. So a, another thing that generally just works is, is the virtual machine. Now, John, John you mentioned this, this uh, removal of the permanent, gen permanent generation feature, mm -hmm. uh, something that's, that's long been in the works. Can you tell us a little bit about, well, what, what's the user impact on that? And then second, why was it so hard? Yes. The user impact is very simple. There's a knob that, um, that is a sharp edge, a, sh a knob with sharp edges which you don't want to have to turn. And in the old days, you had to you had to set the knob to some setting, and then it would, you'd get it wrong eventually. Right. And, that and, was and the, this is this is the dash xx max perm size. Max perm size. Oh boy! And and so we we had a lot of uh, people have trouble with that. Um, so basically, we took out the knob and made the VM adaptively uh, arrange its perm gen size internally. And that required, um, actually, that was a, it amounted to about 10% of our total changes for JDK 8 in source code lines. Wow. It was an incredible amount of work because it involved taking the, uh, the metadata and, and doing its own storage management uh, regime for the, for the metadata, which was a pervasive change. <laughs> Um, now that we have it that way, the VM can more um, gracefully manage its own metadata storage, and the user does not have to turn these knobs that, that generally are just traps. Um, so it was, it, it, we had um, about half a million lines of patch, if you want to measure change churn that way, about almost 2,000 bugs in the JVM that we fixed in our FEs. So it, um, the, of that, about 10% was, was perm gen, and uh, so it was a, a, big, a big piece of work. Mm -hmm. Other than perm gen, what, what, what other big things do, have we done in, in, the, in these lower layer, layers of the plumbing? Uh, I would say that uh, a, a big uh, set of low-level changes, besides performance, performance is always an important theme. We never stop doing performance. Um, but uh, a, a big theme in this uh, set of changes has been uh, cost of ownership, both um, maintain a manageability of the, uh, of the JVM. So we put in these wonderful new hooks for uh, measuring what the JVM is doing and tracing it. Mm -hmm. that, that was another significantly sized change to uh, basically be able to watch JVM events as they happen, uh, sort of a flight recorder, Java flight recorder. Um, and then also other management hooks. And also uh, a, a large percentage of our changes were just cleanups to make the open source easier to work on and simpler and reduce the size, remove un un <coughs> unnecessary features at the source level. Mm -hmm. It's always good to delete code. Deleting's great. Co code deletion engineers. <laughs> so Rich, a, a question from, from Twitter. Why would one choose JavaFX over you know, whatever other client technology might, might be out there? Uh, you know, I think that when, when you're looking at deploying, let's say, um, a rich client application, something a traditional desktop, maybe it's advanced graphics, heavy engineering, 
JavaFX is the perfect platform for doing that kind of work. Um, you know, running on Java, being able to take advantage of the JVM and all the other things that we have in Java gives you a huge advantage. And then just the, the toolkit itself has really been designed around performance and graphics and those sort of capabilities. Um, the, if, if you're targeting embedded, we did a lot of work in JavaFX 8 in order to make FX run well on embedded systems. Um, we use OpenGL, all the hardware acceleration, everything we showed at Java 1 about the Raspberry Pi and Freescale boards and so forth. Um, and so FX is a really, just a natural choice if you're going to build and deploy stuff on embedded. Um, and then of course, on the community side, there are guys in the community who are working on ports to Android and iOS, and so there's work going on there from outside of Oracle. Um, so if you're looking at, at really building, uh, you know, I, I guess I'd say serious applications, serious graphical applications, JavaFX is just a natural choice. It's certainly fun to use. And it is a heck of a lot of fun to use, yeah. I'll be honest with you. Okay, I think may, maybe this is our, our last question. Um, John, why, why did we do not the Nosworn JavaScript engine? What, what, what was the point of that and why was, why was it a good thing? Okay, so uh, Nasworn is a complete rewrite, uh, a complete from scratch, from blank paper implementation of JavaScript. And the reason it's different from uh, 500 other JavaScript implementations is it is written on top of the modern JVM architecture. Um, it, it is fully standards compliant, so it's a, real, it's a real JavaScript, but the thing that makes it unique is that it, uh, it operates with the, the JVM's JIT and garbage collector and concurrency and thread control which means that you can write JavaScript code, but it scales fully and performs fully on the JVM. And then you can also bounce over and call all of the Java APIs straight from JavaScript. So there's a mixed language interoperability story that's really powerful mm -hmm. and fun to use. Yeah. yeah, I've seen some very slick demos of that. OK, well, I think our, our time is just about up. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been fun. So Java is not just a technology. It's also a community of developers. Your continuous involvement in the evolution of the platform is critical to Java's ongoing success. That involvement comes in many forms, suggestions of enhancements and features, reviews of draft, spe draft specifications, bug reports against working implementations, and contributions of actual code and even sometimes whole features like the date and time API we discussed earlier. Much of this interaction happens in two places, the Java community process, which oversees the development of new Java specifications, and the OpenJDK community, where individuals and companies come together to collaborate on the development of implementation. You know, you know something about this open JDK For some stuff, right, Simon? On Java 8, let's now hear from two members of the Java Community Process Executive Committee, Bruno Souza and Jim Goff. So they just uh, finished off with um, something about Java, Nashworn. I'm not just very large at Java user group. Oh, they didn't finish at all. But I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm continuing talking. They, they just finished off about Nashorn. Uh, I'm just wondering, are you guys planning to use that, or do you see any use case for that? Because I, I think it's extremely cool from a technical uh, perspective, just the way they did it and how fast it is. Yeah, hold the but, mic. Um, to be honest, I don't really see the use cases, at least for myself, immediately. And I think everyone here, uh, everyone that's using Java, should. Uh, well, I, I can only state that. It's kind of difficult that uh, you know you have to be a server-side developer or a client-side developer. So if Java's not going to be native in the browser, I guess it kind of makes sense to have JavaScript be native on the JVM. I can see some potential for the industry if that takes off. I'll have to learn JavaScript finally, but uh, I could see it being really good. You, you actually used it, right, Garrett? You were doing some articles on client-side JavaScript? Yeah, I, I used it a bit. Uh, that was just because I liked the idea of being able to script directly JavaFX by using JavaScript. So I don't like JavaScript, but using it as a scripting language by to, to dynamically create, for example, controls at runtime, that was um, more, I, I tried to use it, but uh, I have also no real use case for it at the moment. So it's, uh, it's interesting, but I think it we miss some good examples where you can really use it. So I have no idea. So the examples that you're referring to is mostly using a dynamic language yeah. for stuff you can't do with a so, static, uh, sta a completely static language. language. But why not just use um, JRuby or Groovy, for example? Because those languages are out there already there doing whatever you wanted to do. 
So. It's great to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. And well, I use it just because I don't have to add an additional jar. That was the only reason, because it comes with the JVM, it, it's in the JDK, so I can directly use it. With Groovy, I totally agree, you can do the same things, and even more with Groovy and Groovy script, but JavaScript was, it, now it's there, you can use it. And on an embedded device, I tried it on a Pi. And uh, I tried to avoid using external jars, if possible. I agree on the server side, there's no reason to keep an eye on the memory, but on, a, on an embedded device, it might make sense to just use the, the stuff that is available instead of adding more jars and using other technologies. So that was the reason why, why I tried it. With both uh, Java and Scala internally. So the it's actually part of one of the core profiles because then it would make a lot of sense, actually. And then the example that you are giving. In, in Java 8 the, to make does anyone know that? Is it in the compact JVM profiles? Really a true that's hard? Yeah. Uh, no, no, that's not in compact okay. profile. <laughs> no, no, that, that would be, uh, <laughs> um, be a nice use case. But. So I think All right, let's, uh, see, let's see what our buddy Adam has to say. Uh, with so Adam, Adam Messenger used to be VP of Java SE, I believe. Yeah. Simon, Simon confirms he, he is our longest standing Oracle employee on stage. <laughs> How many VPs of Java engineering did you go through? All right, Simon says quite a few. We've done with Nashorn and getting a pretty different language to run on top of the VM. Um, you know, undoubtedly that makes the VM better for uh, as a multi-language platform and, and for all languages. So I'm I'm happy mm -hmm. to see that. We don't use a lot of we, we don't use any server-side JavaScript at Twitter. But if you look at the popularity of Node, um, you can see it's like something people yeah. want to do. Yeah, and it's amazing. So I'm happy to happy to see you investing. Happy to write on those coattails. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So th can you say a bit more about the about the Scala? The, you know, compare and contrast with Java. Will Will Java mm -hmm. eight you know tip tip any balance there? For engineers at Twitter? <clears throat> you know, I don't know that I can say for sure one way or the other. I do know that one of the reasons people like Scala is for the functional features. Right? Mm -hmm. now, that's the thing that people like about it. And one of the things about that is sort of the uh, conciseness of certain expressions. And I think so, so Lambda does capture a lot of that. And um, you know, in a lot of ways, Java and Scala are, are closer together yeah. than they were before. Sure. And so I think that. That'll for sure help us because it'll be easier to switch from one language to another um, yeah. in your, you know, day-to-day -day work, and people have to do that today. So it's, that'll sure. for sure help us. Yeah. So performance is important. Yeah. So one of the reasons we moved to Java in the first instance was uh, was for performance, and in that first case, you know, we saw performance uplifts, uplifts in some cases of 8x, something like this, with uh, also reduced standard deviation of pause times. Um, it was great, you know, it's been a, just an unqualified win for us. And I, one thing I don't know that we quite realized at the time that we were also going to get was sort of continued improvements. Mm -hmm. And so I was looking at your JBB results and I saw like for like hardware, 50% uplift uh, with, with Java yeah. 8. And that's great, right? Like this is like a gift to keep giving. And we don't yeah. have to do, I mean, we get that for free as a, being up for being yeah. on the platform. Yeah, you know, and, and, and from our perspective, you know, it, 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 we didn't go off and you know, specifically optimize Spec JDB 2013. We just did a bunch of work <laughs> to, to make everything faster and happened to get that result. That's awesome. So you, yeah. you got there the honest way. <laughs> exactly. And um, so, you know, that makes me feel like we haven't, we haven't done a lot of work with Java 8 inside of, uh, inside of Twitter as yet. We have, you know, some, some work, we haven't done a thorough benchmarking. But it makes me think that like, it's quite likely we'll see uplift from yeah. it as well because of the way yeah. you got there. So congratulations on that. That's right. awesome. Thanks. Uh, un unexpected. But, uh, unexpected. But, uh, okay. Right. Um, so performance go going forward, is there any, any particular thing you'd like to see, see done in, uh, in the VM, I, you know, either by, by Oracle engineers or maybe Twitter engineers or somebody else? Yeah. You know, one thing I think yeah. we've, you know, you and I have talked about for years now, honestly, yeah. is uh, is pause times in the VM. And I think that if there's sort of one big challenge left for Java on a performance uh, level, it's our performance from a performance perspective, it's uh, containing pause times. And um, you know, that the latency jitter is probably the only reason we ever think about using another language um, inside, inside Twitter. So I think that you know, this is something we're in, interested in improving, and I know 
from our past conversations, you are oh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I, that's my, my guess and my hope. And I think it only becomes more important uh, in a multi-core world. And I think, but I think also you get new techniques um, yeah. that are things that were cost prohibitive uh, before are now possible because there's sort of a relative change in the scarcity of memory bandwidth to CPU and so right. forth. Of course, one of the, one of the other trade-offs there is the memory is just getting enormous, which makes pause time, <laughs> small pause time really hard to achieve. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. But, for you know, sure. De definitely something I think that a lot of people are in interested in investing in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Adam. My Great pleasure. to see you. Great to be here. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Awkward pause. Another important aspect not, of the Java another job is the worldwide network of Java <laughs> The leaders of many of these groups got together recently and recorded some brief yeah, talks. Yeah, so that was a good Easy one. Easy pause. Let's hear from them now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dario Laverdi, and I run the New York City Java Meetup user group. My name is Tang, and I come, uh, come from China Nanjing Java user group. I'm Bader from Morocco Java user group. So, I'm from Japan. Can anyone Japan. guess who's behind the camera Java interviewing? <laughs> it's about oh, that was you. Members. You were there, so who was interviewing? So it's hard to keep track of last Who was behind the camera? 3200. So I quit the job at the virtual <laughs> you, for, you forgot already. I participate to the Java Leaders uh, Conference. Uh, it's a uh, Good place to uh, communicate to all our core. Hey, Juggy. That's very cool. Juggy. Man. I love, I love this idea of the the, the Vitor Jug. How about Java 8? Are you guys doing cool stuff with Java 8 on, on the VJug? We're going to be talking about lambdas, we're going to be talking about streams, default methods, all the awesome stuff that you can do in Java 8. The most excited uh, feature I, uh, I think is uh, lambda, uh, ja uh, lambda expression. I've been waiting for lambdas for quite some time. It's a critical feature. This feature is very, uh, very similar to uh, some popular dynamic language such as Scala. It's been a long time coming, but it's something everyone's looking forward to. Uh, that's the main feature I'm looking forward to. I'm very, very looking forward. <laughs> so now, what gets you excited about Java 8? What gets me, gets me yes. excited? Well, first of all, the fact that it's actually being launched. It's awesome to get. It's oh, awesome to get. Cool. Uh, it is pretty cool. I wish Java 8 can, uh, can be promoted in China, and I uh, uh, wish um, all the uh, Java experts from all over the world can come to Nanjing and uh, uh, do some demos uh, uh, and promote uh, and promoting Java to launch in deeply. It's awesome yeah, to get so you know, multiple ju versions you of got, Java. You guys are making great uh, conversation. Use the mic. <laughs> He's a natural guest star for the Muppet Show over there, huh? <laughs> Way to use it's, not, it's not hard to look good next to a stuffed parrot, though, is it really? <laughs> Did you sing a song together at the end of that? Uh, yeah, but it wasn't recorded. That was uh, private. As I said earlier, Java 8 includes not just Java SE8, but also Java ME8, which aims to give you the tools you need to develop applications for the Internet of Things. I'm back here with Roger Riggs, who not only helped with the date time API in SE8, but was also one of the specification leads for, for ME8. I guess you've had a busy couple of years, Roger. Oh, yes. <laughs> so what are the main elements of Java ME8? So great question. So the main elements of ME8 are uh, an upgraded CLDC, which is the compact limited device configuration, which is a subset of Java SE to fit in a given footprint. Uh, the Java ME embedded profile, which adds a number of APIs on top of that to handle application provisioning, power management, uh, some device access, and uh, other sort of software nitty gritty things. And there's also a third component is a device API that gives you access to the lowest level hardware connected devices on, on an embedded module. Mm -hmm. Now, th this is the, the first big upgrade we've done on ME8 in quite a while now, right? Right. All the previous work, the, the previous versions were in 2005 and 2006 of, of CLDC, and at the time it was called the uh, the Information Module Profile (IMP). Mm -hmm. um, so, but the advent of of SE8 has given us a chance to kind of pick up the, most of the language features mm -hmm. and and upgrade the APIs 
but with still a, a keen attention to the, uh, the footprint requirements and the, the low CPU power. Um, the only feature which we were not able to get in in this revision is the things relating to Invoke Dynamic and Lambda. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because of trade-off of time and footprint, uh, we're going to work on that for the next revision. Okay, yeah, I think we're, we're looking at a completely different way of implementing That's Lambda for... Right, it's going to need... Any yeah, 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 it's going to need a get, different get implementation, the mic. Less, maybe a little less dynamic than, than the current so, one. So Simon, I'd just like to point out that Steve's on uh, IRC at the moment, and he's just had a message from your wife, and I'm not kidding, about you and Juggie. <laughs> My little boy's at home watching. <laughs> and he's two. So, so you're, you're saying we have to keep this PG? Um, we have to keep this PG level, but good for little kids? No, no, he's, he's a Brit. And a big advantage there. No oh, PG. okay, all right. Not only Brit. The same tools yes. that we use for job SE, but also developer expertise, mm -hmm. where they've come to expect a certain level of, of language, so, ease of use so from the tools and from the tool well. chain. Mm -hmm. So it's a big improvement. Right. What, what are some of the main, uh, main APIs that have been brought down? from SE to NEA? Well, one of the big expansions has to do with the collections APIs mm -hmm. um, and tied in the language there, the, uh, the for loops. Um, the, there's a subset of NIO that's used for file access and for buffering of data, which is very useful. Um, and then there's the, we've enhanced the IO package that was in CLDC quite a bit to support mm -hmm. TLS and bo being both clients and servers of secure connections in these embedded devices, which is essential when talking with servers that sure. are now expecting restful communication as well as, as secure communications. Right, yes, especially secure communications. Yes, especially <laughs> secure communications. <laughs> right. So a anything else you want to say about what's in, what's in MEA? No, it's a, it's a big improvement. It's about time. Uh, it runs on some very small devices, but it's still very capable, and uh, I think everybody should try it out. There's an SDK for it, and yep. it's downloadable, and Freely available. Okay. So, what is, what is the smallest implementation? Um, I think it fits in about in 128k on some microcontrollers, but it's a very specialized application and right. and platform implementation. Okay, but that's still pretty darn impressive. Very impressive. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, Roger. Thank you. Okay. My colleague Peter Uchschneider will be here in a moment to speak with a few other folks about the importance of Java 8 to the Internet of Things. Before that, though, let's hear some thoughts from Zach Shelby of ARM. Sounds like the Simon and Simon the theme song. The important thing to understand about what's happening in the, the Internet of Things right now is that um, we're looking to grow the market. And to grow the market, you have to do two really important things. We have to unify standards for communications and security. And we have to unify the developer ecosystem. We need a turbocharged ecosystem where people have access to SDKs, languages, devices. And I, I think that um, Java is an important piece of that. There's around 300 to 400,000 embedded C developers in the world today, depending on who you ask. Compare that to 9 million developers in the Java space. We believe that in order for the Internet of Things to really grow, we need to open up innovation. And that means startups, um, you know, new developers to the space. And we believe uh, Java ME8 will allow us to tap into that, that huge Java community, developer community on Cortex-M. ARM comes from the background of IP technology for processors. And in particular, Cortex-M is an extremely successful processor technology for small embedded devices through language standards, through open source and standards APIs for communications, we can encourage people to use standards. Making Java ME8 and SE8 be a compatible um, language subset allows us to target technology across all kinds of embedded devices. So, so in terms of the Internet of Things, what's more suitable in a Java sense? Would you say Java ME Hello, everyone. or Compact I'm Profile? Peter Schneider. I'm the Vice President of Product Management well, for Java here at Oracle. Um, I tried and Java ME8 also on, on the small devices, uh, and on the small devices there's no other choice. With some of our so leading it's the only way to go in BIOS. And with us today we and have it's a huge step forward using Java ME8, especially with the best device access API, which makes it so easy to directly access the hardware of this devices, like the I.O. pins and that stuff directly in the JDK, which is awesome. brought out products that 
with Java running. The other thing, if you use the bigger devices like the, the Pi, and doing the something like that, been adopted this is not really, to put Java on really embedded anymore. Sure. It's so big compared to this Cortex M3 um, stuff, let me which take is a step back like a thumb, very small. Where Qualcomm's position That's still powerful, is in the uh, but there you, you can only use Java ME, and I would never so use C in that the, stuff, but uh, sometimes you have to. <laughs> chipset division builds chipsets and sells them to uh, our direct customers or licensees. Those licensees build those chipsets into wireless modules and certify those wireless modules for operation on cellular networks globally. They then sell those wireless modules to application developers, device manufacturers, system integrators for inclusion into final products. Long story short, we're two to three steps removed from that final product and that final product developer is not a direct licensee of Qualcomm and therefore doesn't have access to our modem chipset and application processing. So with that and with the realization that cellular is becoming a more important feature and function in a growing number of devices, we set out to build a solution. So we partnered with Oracle for the, uh, to create the hooks for Java to be that abstraction layer to give the developer access to the technologies on our chipset, and we partnered with one of our direct licensees to build the physical board with its sensors and general purpose IOs to provide a tool for the IOE developer to rapidly build and prototype devices with bomb optimized and tightly integrated cellular connectivity. We couldn't be more pleased with the adoption so far. We've announced partnerships with two global operators for the platform, and they expose them to their developer community. We've done hackathons with those developers. We've done hackathons with Oracle. And through our uh, integration and distribution partner, Ethereos, we've seen these kits end up in the hands of a wide range of industry developers across the globe. Very good. Well, I think Java, you know, we all see the promise of Java and IoT. And, and I guess over to you, Jeff. Um, you know, what it, is it at Freescale? And what's your IoT offering? And what role does Java play for you with the solution? Yeah. In addition to microcontrollers and application processes directly supporting edge node devices, aggregators and gateways, we've actually developed a full IoT gateway. It's a, a full Java development platform and uh, has, uh, contains a full native Java development environment. The, uh, this gives us um, great um, ability to do uh, secure services delivery across the network as well as portable embedded applications development. In addition to that, we also support Oracle event processing at the gateway level. Uh, this offers local intelligence, such as data filtering and real-time processing. OK, great. And you know, in addition to working with our partners, Qualcomm and Freescale, of course, um, we have a great relationship with ARM all the way back on the chip design. And um, Charlene, it would be helpful if you could um, you know, let us better understand kind of the partnership and cooperation between Oracle and ARM as it relates to M to M and IoT. Sure, yes. I mean, we're really focused in that we think there's going to be a rich class of devices in IoT deployment. So a diverse range so of... So while they're talking, products. let's talk about Raspberry Pi awesomeness that's happened this year. <laughs> Hasn't it been really great to see all the hacking that people have been done doing with Java on the Raspberry Pi? Like, what's the coolest stuff that you've seen? Well, well, the, the coolest thing I've done... So, so was it last year? No, it was the year before last when I was working uh, for IBM, GoJ9. Um, was I got a, I got a Raspberry Pi actually before they were sent out. So I was one of the lucky ones, um, and and we put uh, an app server that maybe we shouldn't name on the Raspberry Pi uh, with the full. It wasn't Glassfish, no. Uh, with with the full uh, with the full Java stack. Um, and we did. We tried both with the Oracle JVM and the uh, IBM JVM, and we ran uh, we ran that, uh, that the, an app server on that, which was pretty cool. You know, running on something with 256 so mega RAM. <coughs> you're you're going to start replacing data centers with your Raspberry Pi solution? What, why not? <laughs> Who needs to buy all these big mainframes, right? Exactly, exactly. Replace and it with just something that fits in your pocket. And that's, that's since actually been replaced by um, uh, one of their new projects which they've done, which is they've, they've put that Raspberry Pi on a, on a remote control car, 
yeah, bouncing that around and yeah, having to play with that. So, so it's, a, it's a mobile data center. Yeah, but talking of Raspberry Pis and cars. So, uh, I was going to say, because from my point of view, the, the coolest thing I've done is putting a Raspberry Pi in my car and actually linking it to the car through the service port. And the presentation I did this morning talked about that and how you can actually hack your car with a Raspberry Pi and then have an accelerometer as well so you can do all sorts of Formula One displays and, and things like that. So I, I had a lot of fun doing that. And, and the other thing, just to keep going, um, I have a Raspberry Pi in my shed, which is connected to a weather station, and so I'm doing some interesting stuff with that as well. Yeah, powerful technologies for... So actually, um, the, well, what Simon was talking about, uh, about this car, that's actually the coolest thing I've seen with it as well. I, I didn't do that, but I have some plans actually trying something similar now, because I saw your talk in the morning, and he actually hooked up um, a Raspberry Pi uh, to, his, to the bus in his car and get all this data out of it, and um, yeah. I'm into uh, uh, sim racing. And when you tune your car, you want to collect all kind of data and make decisions based on that. And now I can actually do the same thing with my car, which is pretty awesome. So, um, you know, that, that, that's the, 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 actually my first project doing something like that. Uh. Provision and support. All right, so you, you probably have multiple things you've done with the Raspberry Pi, which is pretty cool. For me, it's just a little bit outdated right now. Raspberry Pi, that's like two years ago, right? Yeah, you know, it's old technology. So it's <laughs> no, you can do a lot of fun things with it. And at the moment, I'm working on a wearable device based on the Raspberry Pi, so you can put it in your pocket, measuring heart rate and uh, GPS position and stuff like that. I hope it will be ready for Java 1, so um, that's the, the next big thing. But I have so many embedded stuff at home, so it's not only the Pi. I use Java on the BeagleBone, QB board, whatever it is. Just, uh, you can do so many things, unlimited possibilities. So it's, it's great. One, one other thing that I did uh, with a guy from IBM called Andy Stamford Clark, who lives on the Isle of Wight, which is a, a small island just below the UK. Uh, we used uh, Eclipse Paho, which is uh, an open source MQTT client. And uh, what we did was we grabbed the Raspberry Pi, we put an app server, Liberty Profile from IBM, on it. Um, and uh, obviously being run with uh, the Oracle JVM or J9. And uh, we, I, I wrote up a little web, web client which automatically sent MQTT messages across and turned on and off lights in his home uh, from where I lived, which was about 50 kilometers away. Uh, turned on. Um, uh, I think the other thing is uh, it was a little fountain in his in his in his pool outside, <laughs> and, uh, and and you can effectively view the full energy status of his house. And of course, because it was on a Pi, you can stick that in an HDMI port straight into the television, and you've got your own channel where you can see the status of your house wherever you are. So, and so awesome. The broad ecosystem around Java. Uh, Stephen Jansen did a, a really cool thing with uh, putting uh, he put Tommy on a Raspberry Pi, but he made it so that you could control a scoreboard for a, a basketball game because the local uh, equipment had gone so uh, poorly maintained so they ripped it all out and they replaced it with like a Raspberry Pi based system and the cool thing about his story is that all the really practical details that they had to figure out like uh, when they pressed the button on the phone they had they originally had like an uh, interface on the cell phone and you could press the stop start button on the phone and then that didn't really work out so well because sometimes the cellular network went down and then the game's still going and they should have paused it you know so they had to actually like wire buttons up to a box that were hooked up to IO ports on the Raspberry device and it was all powered by Java it was really cool he submitted that talk for Java once so I hope it gets approved nice yeah, I saw I saw that lightning talk, and he he said there was a concurrency problem, where uh, where, where two people both tried to neg uh, negate a score, and it turned out that sort of one of the team's scores was negative during a live game. So awesome. Well, I guess are there any other thoughts that you'd like to add to our discussion here today in closing? Anything else? Well, I, I guess I think the, uh, the ability or the the numbers, the sheer numbers of Java developers coming to IoT edge node products, expanding the range of applications we can do over the next few years. It's a really exciting time. Okay. You know, I'm excited. Um, there's so much promise ahead of us in IoT, and um, our teams have been working for quite some time to make Java 8 happen. It's a very large milestone uh, for us. But equally important are the partnerships that we build with companies um, like yourselves. And so I'm very, very appreciative for the ongoing cooperation. 
I think there's a lot of bright um, work ahead of us and, and good positive things that we're going to see in the market. So thank you very much for coming and supporting our launch and your ongoing support. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, and with that, that concludes our panel for today. At this time, I'd like to pass back over to my colleague, Mark. Thanks, Peter. Thank you for see, joining us see, today. See, we, we to paid attention to the architect panel, the and when the suit panel came on, uh, you, you, you did a good save there, Dave. Good work. Yeah, well, we had to talk about something a little more fun. screencasts and other resources we put together at oracle.com slash java8launch. The best way to learn the new features, of course, is to go write some actual code. You can download JDK8 directly from j.mp slash getjava, all caps, and I'm happy to say that the new language features are already supported by NetBeans, Eclipse, and IntelliJ. I hope that you have as much fun using Java 8 as we did building it. Happy hacking, and thank you very much. So let's see if we can get another awkward moment to, to fill the time. Oh, okay, they cut to a slide. All right, we are, we are done. But we actually have folks on a live Google Hangout who are also doing launch parties, parties in different parts of the world. So um, let, me, let me see if I can make this bigger. What is it, F11? Oh. Uh, full screen. Control shift F. Wow. Okay. And I'm going to unmute us. There we go. All right. So for our, for our buddies in different parts of the world, um, we have the, the stream live here. Um, you guys are, I believe, looking through the tiny little camera on my laptop. Let me see. Okay. There we go. Now you can see us, hopefully. Hi. <laughs> so we've got folks in different parts of the world. This is Sven, and I believe they're in um, nearby Lake Constance in southern Germany. So how are you guys doing there, Sven? Say something. Sven waked. Sven waved. You have to unmute yourself, Sven, if you want to say anything. Yeah, no unmuting. Watching footage of a <laughs> 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 I'm muted. Uh, full screen. So there you are. We're awesome. doing fine here. Okay. So, how is your beer? It's better than ours. There we go. Okay, so I'd recommend closing the live stream while you're chatting. That might prevent right, feedback. So, for our, for our buddies in different parts of the world, um, we have the. Yes, thanks for muting uh, yourself, Sam. Okay, and then we have Shazad. And we also have Christian. Hey, Christian, you want to say hi? So we're on air. So I believe. Hi. Yes, you are on air. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you guys like the Java 8 launch? What did you think of the the panel that Mark put together? Yeah, yeah you like. Right. We didn't find. You don't mute yourself, Sven, if you want to say anything. I am muted. Oh, Sven's trying to say something. Right, yeah. so we, uh, Let's go back to Sven. We just watched the, uh, <laughs> oh, the live stream. Yeah. So, so for folks in the audience, this probably reminds you of trying to do a video conference in your, um, in your company, right? Lots of people trying to connect audio issues, video issues. That's how you can tell this is live and unrehearsed. <laughs> Exactly. And I believe the last group we have is actually, um, they're T-Cube and they're in, um, we're getting the, we're in the Dublin, Ireland. So we don't have any video from them, but they're actually joining us from Dublin and watching the, watching the live stream as well. All right. Well, thanks guys for joining the live stream. We're going to, we're going to keep you on mute because the audio issues are making it mostly unusable. But um, enjoy the rest of the panel. We're going to hold a little panel here for the next few minutes. And um, then we'll, we'll call it a night hacking night. All right, so um, impressions. Java 8. We talked about Raspberry Pi and Embedded. That's, yeah. that's
probably the most different thing about this release compared to previous Java releases. There's a huge focus on Java SE and Java ME embedded devices. Well, if you took it the, like a look at a macro scale, with the embedded stuff, we're kind of seeing Java go out into the world in places where there weren't typically good computers, which is kind of cool. So Java's literally gaining ground in the literal sense of the word ground. So that's kind of nice. Uh, with Nashorn, I guess we can kind of see maybe some UI and, and front-end developers kind of come to the back end, which is another kind of interesting migration potential. So there's definitely some ch potential changes in terms of the landscape and where the developer talent is and where Java lives. So do you guys, you guys see the JVM becoming more ubiquitous across devices, platforms? I have absolutely no idea, but it, it, I mean, it looks like that. This is the first steps to uh, towards that, and um, that's probably going to happen in the in the near future. But uh, what I wanted to say is that I mean, um, these are all very really interesting things. That that there's new ground coming to uh, to Java. But at the same time, if you are already in Java for a long time and you're just doing, um, let's say, server side development, like I'm doing, uh, for example, I mean, this is also an extremely interesting uh, release and. Probably the most exciting release since, well, at least Java 5. Yeah. I mean, the, the fact that Java or, or that Lambda is, is now part of the language, that's, that's completely changing the way you will uh, write any kind of code, probably. All right, so speaking of Lambdas, what do you guys think the impact on other JVM languages is going to be now that Java has them proper? A big selling point of Closure and Ruby and Scala in the past has been the fact that Java didn't have lambdas. So um, to speak for myself, I've, I've been playing around with uh, Groovy for a very long time already. I did a little bit of uh, Scala, a li little bit of Ruby as well. And um, they all have their nice features. But the most important thing is um, the fact that they have closures or lambdas or whatever you want to call it or whatever format exactly is. And that's the thing that you immediately start missing as soon as you go back to just Java programming. That's the thing I miss. And all the other things, well, you can kind of live without it. And of course, a dynamic language is very different, and you can do different things with it. So it will probably not replace a dynamic languages at all, because it's just a completely different thing. But just from a programming um, uh, perspective, uh, when you just write your code and you don't need dynamic features per se, then Lambdas is, is well, kind of the, the only thing that you will miss if you go back to Java. I also think with uh, with a number of the new features in Java, there's a there's a vast amount that can be uh, you know made use of, such as lambdas, default methods, which are really really powerful, really really awesome, and can you can write beautiful code with them. However, there's also the potential to write really awful code with them, and, <laughs> and, and I think with you know if you, if you go back to something like I don't know something like generics. Something, something that originally confused developers initially who didn't spend the time in learning them. I, I still get confused. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you're going to have that 10% of the Java developers who absolutely love their coding and will learn Java inside out, and then 90% of the coders who have to support it. And, and you know, th things, like, th things like lambdas, so long as they're used in the right way. Uh, I saw a piece of code, I'm not sure if it was on Twitter or something else, but it was... Um, it was, a, it was a code block, uh, a, a Lambda code block, uh, which had a try catch. And at the very, very end after that, there was this, I think it was a dot um, sum. And, and, you know, it's really hard to read. It's, you'll miss that. So, so Lambdas are very, very powerful, but you can also abuse them. Uh, in the same way, default methods. I mean, you know, default methods multiple are... Multiple inheritance. Uh, well, right. Hear it for multiple inheritance. Who likes oh. multiple inheritance? Well, multiple, in multiple inheritance of types, yes. Multiple inheritance of behavior, yes. Multiple inheritance of state, no. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing my first like page-long lambda. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that, that for me, the really powerful thing in Java right, is, is the combination of lambdas, is the combination of extension methods, and then the streams API. Because when you put all those three things <coughs> together, and the ability to do functional programming around collections, it just like it looks so nice in terms of the code and how clean it is and the way that you can then decompose that into parallel operations if you want to just by changing you know one line of the code say rather than give me a stream give me a parallel stream and it happens you know it's, it's magic yeah. 
Yeah, definitely like the first thing that I'm looking forward to deleting in my code base is, is all of the for loops that literate over 10,000 different entries to do very heavy things. You know, as an app server developer, it's like, all right, we're currently deploying components in serial, and now I can just change a couple lines of code and I can like, I'll do it all in parallel. And hey, if you got a bunch of cores and a processor, this is what you do, your app's gonna start up way faster. Yeah, uh, and one of the things I'd also like to mention about that is the fact that if you look at NetBeans, the support that they built into NetBeans for lambdas and extension methods and the streams API is really good because you now have like sort of the ability to do bulk refactoring in NetBeans and you can say basically find all the places where I'm doing loops that can be converted into uh, streams and lambda expressions and it'll give you a lot of hints and say you know like one click and like it will change the code for you and replace where you've used a loop with a lambda expression and, and that kind of thing is great because it's you know it simplifies having to go through all your code and not having to worry about right I've got to retype all this it's just like no click 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 boom and it's done. Yeah and I, I can definitely attest I mean a, a, as a back-end person we have great skill to do great things in parallel but the cost and development time is quite high so even if you have the knowledge of the Java U2 concurrent libraries, it's still not very easy to, to use that everywhere where it would be applicable because the complexity it adds to code is, is quite, a, quite a lot of overhead. So with the Stream API, you can really get all that in there and have the code still maintain readability and be very clean. It's just a huge win, huge, huge win. All right, so this, GC pause. <laughs> this is our GC pause time. Beer, beer pause, maybe? Everyone needs a, another round? <laughs> Cheers. So, so one of my other, one of the other things which I kind of found confusing was, uh, I think it was actually a, a session which you gave, Simon, in, um, it was in Morocco, J Maghreb. Okay. And it was, uh, there was a whole bunch of kind of uh, predicates and, and consumers and producers all being passed into a, a method. And you essentially had a method which the invocation was almost longer than the, uh, than the method itself. And, you know, it kind of, it, it draws me back to when you see those methods with like 10 to 15 billion values of like true, true, false, false, true, true, false. And, and it's hard to distinguish what's what. And it kind of cries out for something like, you know, named parameters or something like that, which would just make everything simpler. You know, how do you avoid that confusion and complexity on a, on a method invocation where you have producers and consumers? Come on, come on, we can't just have this as a nice, we can't just have a nice panel, let's, let's turn it dirty. Now we're getting so, down and so dirty. Now I'm having to think, because like, I'm, I'm trying to think, like, what session did I do when we were in Morocco? And then I'm trying to think, well, what code did I have? Um, um, desperately tries to think of something to say. Uh, no, it's, it's, uh, I've got no idea. <laughs> I'd, I'd have, as I, I say to a lot of people, well, I'd have to have a look at the code to, you know, analyze that. <laughs> Here's a cheap blanket answer. Don't blame the paintbrush for the, what the artist makes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. again, it comes back to the fact that there's a lot of power in the developer's hands now, and it, it's, it's up to them to write good or bad code, as it always has been, but it's kind of more, more rope to hang themselves with, right? But still more power to write beautiful code, which I'm sure there will be. It, exactly, because one of the things you've got to bear, remember is that with power comes responsibility. So you've got to be responsible when you use these powerful features. Yeah, so my, my guess how Lambdas really shakes out is there's like a half dozen to a dozen really good patterns that emerge. Yeah, which, definitely. You know, for example, the Streams API are a really good example of how to use the, the Lambdas API effectively. Um, they create some primitives like predicates and different things you pass in and you reuse, and those patterns will get reused in other APIs. And then other things like, I've seen somebody try to do builders in Lambdas. Oh, no. And it, it's really bad. Yeah. You I can mean, count the number of arrow brackets on the same line, and then you know you're in trouble. In, in, in just 
reference to abusing code and, and see the 50,000 line lambda, I mean, I still occasionally see somebody who will write a method and it starts with an if, and then 100% minus one line of that code is in the if block. At the end is, a, <laughs> is, a, is, is like a nothing. It's like you forgot, the, you, you spent an hour coding that and you forgot the, 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 the not case in the bottom. You know, it's like maybe you could just if not, then throw an exception, then do your code. You know, it's a, there'll, there'll be some patterns. <laughs> All right, so different topic. The date and time APIs, we were talking about things which made the language significantly more complex. Someone has to say the joke, it's about time it got added. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was obligatory. <laughs> There's a time and a place for that, yeah. It's not here. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm going to mention again how, how crucial the LJC has been in, in the date time API. Uh, at Richard Warburton and at Java Jim Goff were, were crucial in, 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 in adding this. Date time has been, su has su has, is something that Java has struggled with from day one. Um, it's been a pain for anyone to use date time before the date time API JSR came in. If it wasn't for community support and interaction, it could well have continued beyond the introduction of this. Um, and it's great to see that the JCP isn't just being pushed by corporations, but being pushed by Java users. Because at the end of the day, the majority of people who use Java aren't big corporations, they are Java users. And it's crucial to get their feedback. So. Uh, yeah, I, I saw Jim Goff uh, do, in fact, was it a night hacking um, session with you at the IOUC in January? Yeah, he, he yeah, no, really I actually good. did an interview and he went through the API and that was really a good way to learn it. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Dayton API is a lot richer than you would think from something as mundane as calendars and... <laughs> and it shows the power of the daytime API to a user exactly. rather than a machine. <laughs> I mean, like, Joe to Time is probably one of the number f top five libraries that I see in just about everybody's web app. And so the fact that it's now kind of in VM at a very fundamental level is a really huge thing because everyone's got their own version of it and they all conflict and this is just a really good thing. And another interesting thing from that is that, um, um, I mean, Joe to Time was there for a long time already and it worked really well. And now that's standardized, basically. And that, that's, I think, a perfect example how standardization uh, should take place. Um, I mean, you try out something in an innovative way in the community, um, try stuff out, and then standardize it and bring it back to the platform. And you see that more and more in Jaffe as well, which is really good. Yeah, I think that absolutely right, though, that. Because I think one of the nice things about Java is that in terms of the development is we're not afraid to like pull in community contributions. So if you look at Java EE and the way that we pulled in a lot of stuff around, you know, some of the ideas behind Hibernate and Spring yeah. and now with, with Java SE, as you say, Joda time and some of the other things that people have done, it, it, you know, like concurrency utilities were external to Sun and, and Oracle. So it's really nice to see that we, we're not afraid to actually say, yeah, other people have got great ideas. Let's bring them into the base platform and let people use them. And, uh, and another another JSR which is kind of similar in this in a sense in a way is the is the no I was going to say the the um, an upcoming one it's, is it the currency JSR I'm not sure what number it is this this is the kind of JSR that we need that I think we need community support from people who are writing um, uh, financial apps you know it's really really important for for people in in that position to help help create the api you want to use don't just be stuck with an api which which you have to use yes because that, that's a, a classic example of why you want the community involved because like if you take you know, an engineer who, like, their idea of currency is, well, how much do I get paid this month? You know, they're not going to know what, what people who are writing trading applications need. So you need people writing trading applications to tell you what the specification is, and then you bring that into the platform. So absolutely, we need community involvement there. Yeah, and, and, and I think very often in, in the past, people, at the J, people in the JCP have almost been at the wrong level to, to, to contribute. They're not necessarily the people who are coding day in, day out. You know, we want the we want feedback from people who are more into Eclipse than they are their their email client, right? Well, we've had a, like a tremendous amount of progress in the JCP in terms of its 
ability to have people participate. So if you just fast, if you just rewind 10 years ago, there weren't any even open source vendors on the JCP. And those are the first ones that were added were in like, you know, around 2005 when Hibernate uh, got invited in and things like that. And since then, just the, the amount of participation from communities, open source, or Java user groups has just really increased. And so much so that Java EE 7, for example, was the first specification for Java EE developed openly so that anybody could participate. And, uh, you know, these are fairly big changes, so much so that I think people haven't really realized that you could actually participate in JSRs if you wanted to which makes programs like Adopt the JSR that much more important to tell people, hey, this is your language. It's better if you participate in developing it, and it's better for everybody if, if you do. And, you know, it's contribute. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an open model. It's very, very good. And in the, it's good, not symbolically, it's good when people actually use it. Yeah, and I think for people, who, for people in the room, who want to learn more about Adopted JSR, there's a, there's a table in the far corner, um, Daniel Bryan and, and Manny, uh, who are talking about Adopted JSR and Adopt Open JDK. They will, they will chat you through it, and, and they're both members of the LJC. So they'll give you first-hand experience of what helping in the community actually is. Uh, for those, anyone online, uh, is, there's, uh, what is it, java.net slash something like Adopted JSR, probably. Yeah. <laughs> If, if, if right, not, so it should be, right? <laughs> we, we've been focusing on some of the larger issues or the larger features of Java 8. So here's trivia time. Pass the mic around. Name one, <laughs> name one other feature of Java 8 that we haven't yet talked about. <laughs> Let me give you a hit, Garrett. Did we talk Java, about Java JavaFX 8? JavaFX. JavaFX, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a new version of JavaFX now. Okay, that's too broad. Name a specific okay, JavaFX feature. Hmm. A good question. <laughs> At the moment, I have no idea, to be honest. I use it since a year Ooh. now, and it's so normal. <laughs> three, three what? <laughs> are we, are we going to mime? We're going to mime features now? No, just let me think about it. Maybe Paul has some idea. Well, I was in Simon's talk. Um, he showed us 55 new features, and I can't kind of come, come up with anything right now. So, well, that worked Unfair out really well. Unfair <laughs> advantage. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's a good talk, though. Um, can we talk about default methods? Which which one? Yeah, default. Oh, oh, well, I, I'll talk a little bit more about. It. I think I think default methods is like like um, a brilliant idea to add such a new feature to the language and change all the uh, existing um, uh, clusters in the JDK. So that actually, um, what I think is amazing is that uh, Lambdas is not just some new language feature. And then we have to wait for others to solve the, um, the library problem. Um, it's actually part of everything in, um, in Java now. And um, the only way to do that without, well, breaking everyone uh, everyone's existing code is by adding something like default methods. And I think that's pretty awesome, the, the, the way they managed to work around that. So that's cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think the addition of default methods is, is crucial for pushing Java forward. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot of abuse in what can be done in terms of making, making interfaces look like actual abstract classes um, or, or making abstract classes look more like interfaces these days. Um, one thing I'd like to see is, is, I don't know why this wasn't added in Java 8, maybe Simon could mention, uh, is, is why functional interfaces aren't functional classes, why you can't have a, an abstract class as a functional interface maybe. Um, but, but it's a minor thing, really. Um, what the, one of the things which, uh, which, I don't know, let me think, of those 55, it's hard to remember. Maybe the, uh, the, the you know, you've got the fork join improvements and, and the fact that, the fact that a lot of that is hidden away in, in the streams. So, I mean, you know, concurrency and things like that are, are hard and everyone gets them wrong, ir irrespective of whether they think they get them right. So it's great to see that being kind of abstracted away slightly from the user, just to, just to avoid pain. Um, I don't know if that counts as a, as a thing, but I'm taking it. So didn't named parameters make it in? No? <laughs> Damn it. Well, that would have been mine. That's a good guess for Java 9, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I hope it makes it in there, because I want to delete the name 
attribute of my query parameter, JAXRS annotation. Yes. So I don't have to duplicate my name twice in my code. But all right, I'll wait. I'll wait. Maybe we can get meta annotations in there along with name parameters. <laughs> all right. Simon. Oh, Simon. Yeah. oh Garrett. Before Simon oh, takes you, off. You thought of one. Yeah, You're going to redeem yourself. I told you. <laughs> so for me, it's uh, one, because I'm mainly in the JavaFX thing, so um, CSS support in JavaFX 8. Th this is really a big step forward that I was missing in uh, JavaFX 2, so that you can use the CSS pseudo classes and stylable properties. Means you can style or you can uh, define things in the CSS file, and you have listeners in your class that will react on the changing of the CSS. So that means it gives you the chance to, for example, the customer can use a CSS file to set parameters in your code without changing the code itself. That, that's really, that's a big step forward. And uh, I, I'm just playing around with it because it has so many possibilities. So that, that's one thing that was, I'm sure, not mentioned right now. <laughs> All right, so you, are, hopefully you're not going to rattle off all the rest of the ones for us, are you, Simon? No, no. Okay, so th this is a little unfair because, of course, the presentation I did earlier today was 55 new features in Java SE8, so I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with a list of new features in, in Java. No, I haven't got the slides. You're right. Continue so. at 56. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say that one, one of the new features which I only really learned about recently, which is really cool, is optional. And I don't mean the feature is optional, I mean the new optional class. And it, it's kind of tied into streams. And to me, it's really good because it, it allows you to get around this problem of if you chain together method calls, if one of those methods returns a null, then you obviously get a null pointer exception thrown. Now, other languages have got different ways of dealing with this because you've got the, the good old Elvis operator, which we discussed a lot about putting into Java. And we never got around to doing that. But having the idea of an optional is this concept of having an, an object which contains either an object or nothing, which, which kind of sounds a bit like, well, OK, so what? But the way that it's been implemented is using almost like the streams approach, where you can treat it like a stream of either zero or one elements. And then you've got these, these methods that you can call on that. So you can say, if it's there, do this. But if it's not there, you don't do it. And then you can also filter it, so you can say, if it's there and it meets some predicate that you define as a lambda expression, then do this. And you've also got the idea of or else. So the, there's this whole idea of making the, the way that the methods are used more expressive. And I think that they've done a good job with that in terms of the, the stream API as well. Because, <laughs> um, because you, you now make it more readable by using names of methods that make a bit more sense. So you, you say like stream dot of, stream of something. And then you say what you want a stream of. So the method name is actually of. So things like that I think are, are really powerful in terms of, of new features. Um, so, so do you want like a really obscure new feature that you know is in Java SE8? Yeah, we want one which we wouldn't normally guess. So we have more options left. OK. Um, oh, yeah, OK. So in the. In the Linux implementation of the random method, <laughs> we, we've, we've changed the way that works because one of, the, one of the problems you have on Linux sometimes is if you're using random and you want a lot of random numbers very quickly, you can actually run out of random numbers because the way that Linux, yeah, Linux implements it with a, with a, a wonderfully named thing called an entropy pool. So, so there's like a pool of numbers that it generates underneath. And in Linux, you can actually run out of the, the entropy pool. So you run out of random numbers. Now, it's, it's not like it just blocks for a while until it, it <laughs> refills the pool. But we've, we've worked around that. So now we've kind of reworked the idea. And, and you don't get the same problems with running out of um, random numbers. So that, that's one thing that's uh, a kind of more obscure thing. Yeah, g g going back to the optional, not that, uh, not that that latter one doesn't keep me up at night every night, but <laughs> going back to the optional, that, that really reminds me of a mix between two things. You know, in Scala, I think, is it, is it option in Scala you have, where yeah, it's yeah, either option. some or none? That, that really reminds me of that, crossed between, a, crossed between that and a dot question mark between each... Uh, is that the Elvis operator? That is the Elvis operator, yeah. 
and, and I think that's another thing, you see, because we, we, we do actually look at other languages and we see what other people do in other languages and we say, well, that's quite a cool feature. Annotations, for example, yeah, let's add those to Java. So it's things like that. We, we do pull in ideas from other places, so yeah. All right, so I got a question for um, Sven for you. Okay. Simon, give, give Simon back the mic. Oh, so, yeah. so Sven is in, out in um, southern Germany. There's Sven. And he is wondering, question for Simon, will optional be all over our Java APIs just like it happened in Scala? Um, I, is, I, well, certainly not at the moment. So optionals are used primarily with the, the streams API. So a lot of the things where you get to the terminal operation in your stream will return, rather than a result, they will return an optional, so that you can then use that to say, okay, if the stream returns a result, do something. If it doesn't, then you've got the option to, to avoid the problem of there nothing, being nothing in terms of the result. Um, they are used in one or two other places, but primarily, you know, it's, it's used for the stream API, and then in your code where you want to chain together a number of method calls, then you can use that in, in that way. So I would say that maybe it will expand to other uses as well. Okay, makes sense. Um, and also Sven had a, a recommendation for Java 9. So we're gonna, our next question for the panel is going to be what feature, if you could choose, would you most like to see in the upcoming Java 9 release? Sven has voted for value types. Yep. Yeah, yeah, value types would be a, a good thing. Definitely. Yeah, so, but he already got that one. You had to pick yeah. a different one, Simon. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to be a little contentious here, and I'm going to say I'd like to really see Project Jigsaw <laughs> finally oh. make it into Java. <laughs> All right. So well, how much did Mark pay you to say that? <laughs> no, no, I don't think Mark wants me to say that. Yeah. You, know. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, the, the, the uh, one that I would like to see the most is annotation reuse. So I was sort of talking about this earlier today with, with Steven in the sense that we have a, a stack of annotations that we put on various methods and various fields and, and parameters, and we can't reuse them. And so we have copy and paste all over our code base these days. So if you have, and I see people on the, on the thing kind of flip, flip, flipping out at the moment, yeah. If you're writing a JAX-RS application, you have, let's say, 100 different uh, get, put, delete methods and they all have to say the media type that they return via at produces. You've copied and pasted XML and JSON 100 times in your application, and then if you want to just change it, now you're looking at a lot of find and replace, and that's very anti-object-oriented programming. It's, we're, and then we, we don't, that's not the only annotation that we are using in that fashion. If you happen to use EE security with at roles allowed, you have manager, employee, comma, whatever, copied on every single method where you want to restrict it over your whole entire application, and these annotations stack up, and now we have configuration data spread throughout our entire code base, and to be able to rope that in and say, when I use the annotation manager, I want that to imply at roles allowed you, you're manager. Gonna, you want to change your vote here, Simon? No, 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 I'm just thinking like, so hang on, I, if we pull all that information together, couldn't we call it, I don't know, a deployment descriptor? You mean like XML again? Yeah. <laughs> I, I am being facetious here. <laughs> yeah, it would be a really great, great way to get control of our APIs again. And, yeah. and, and, and deal people back into to code, code the complexity of their application. And instead of having six or seven annotations on one method or 12 if they want to use JAX-WS and JAX-RS and yeah, no, no, no. Well, well, for people who actually program with annotations, Job e, yeah, absolutely. Then this is a natural thing to want to be able to have reuse in your programming language. Of course. Right? Especially when you have annotations that spread across two different JSRs. For example, bean validation and JPA. We sort of realized they work well together. So we made it so those two JSRs work well together, but we still have to have double the annotations on there. So you can say at uh, zip code, which is the bean validation annotation to validate the field of that JPA uh, object. Uh, and that JPA object will also have some sort of information on there what column it maps to. But if you're going to use that kind of column 50 times in your application, wrap that up as one annotation, stick it on that field, and then just use it everywhere. 
and you've gained a considerable amount of control in your application. And the, the really neat thing is that annotation that says, say, at zip code field, that could be in one little jar that's an API jar, and all your developers just use that API jar, and then now you're not relying on your individual workers to do this correctly every single time. You've uh, reined in the control, you've, you've made it so it's easy to change. <coughs> it's a, there's a lot of benefit to, to reuse. All right, I, I, I'm bought in. So we have modularity, annotations, meta annotations. Yeah. So, Simon? So, so I've got a list, and I'm not sure which one you, to You've pick got a, yeah. a list. So uh, the lists, so we want, no, no, we want no, the list. <laughs> pri priority ordered list. Well, I don't want to go through all of them, so I don't want to take others. But OK, the one, I'll, one. The one I'll choose is method extensions. Method That's like, like, like object extensions. So, so, so basically, all method extensions. So basically, in other languages, like extend, for example, or, or is it Kotlin or Salon? Kotlin. Whereby I can have uh, an existing object, an existing class, say socket, and I'm going to create a method extension uh, on top of that, on top of that class to say send HTML or send HTML response or whatever. And then I can call from my class, I can call socket dot send HTML response, and I can effectively locally and in the scope of of where I define uh, that ex that method extension, uh, I, c I can define behaviour for that class. So I can effectively then make invocations on a class to make my code way more readable. <laughs> All right, so actually we have a request from our Hangout for you, Simon. So, uh -oh. Sven. Yeah, the other Simon, Simon Maple. Sven would like you to talk about perm gen removal and why it's a good thing. So I, I take it Sven knows who I work for. <laughs> uh, okay, so I guess I'd order to do a product pitch here, even though JRebel is awesome. Um, but yeah, did you, did you like the way I did that? So, so yeah, I mean, I mean, perm, perm gen removal, perm gen has been a pain in the ass for for everyone who who. Who, who writes Java applications? Yeah, uh, let's take let's take Tomcat for example. Uh, if I was to if I was to redeploy in Tomcat a number of times or republish a number of times in Tomcat, I I, I think what, what why Tomcat? Why to, uh, after about six, maybe seven or eight redeploys, you're going to have to restart your Tomcat application. Maybe not too big a problem when Tomcat doesn't take too long to restart, but yeah, it's a massive pain in the ass. Um, why is it a problem for me personally? Well, well, yeah, the products that I am an evangelist for does get around that, um, but there are plenty of other reasons why j is awesome, so we're good. <laughs> All right, good answer. Uh, so, you your turn, Paul. Talk about, yep. So, um, right here in front of me, there is a beer overflow exception going on. Um, but we'll manage that. Uh, so the future, uh, probably that I, I, actually I want to have a future that I don't want to see. So the future that I don't want to see is uh, Jigsaw, which is kind of strange <laughs> because um, so you're, you're vetoing team... you're vetoing Simon's vote. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so that, that is kind of strange because the big theme that I've been working on uh, for the past few years is modularity. So it would make sense for me to say, well, I want modularity in in the language. The problem is if you don't want to break backwards compatibility for e per pretty much everyone and Java and well everything. Um, we have to come up with uh, like a half-baked modularity solution, which is not going to help anyone. It's going to make life hard for some people. It's not going to make the people who actually care about modularity truly happy because it's a half-baked solution. So why not just accept the fact, uh, accept the fact that some people just well probably don't care about it and stimulate the fact that there are already working solutions out there and uh, make it easier for people to get on uh, onto that. Um, I think that, that would be the wise thing to do. On the other hand, we can also say we just break everyone else's code and implement the proper modularity solution. I mean, that, that would be actually the future that I do want to have, but that's not that realistic, probably. Do you want to comment on that, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no that was, so, a, so that was a challenge. No, so, see, modularity is a, a real sort of uh, difficult issue to solve because, of course, you've got modularity in, in multiple levels because, what, to me, what Jigsaw really is about is, is modularizing the Java platform. And I think we're moving away because 
we always had like early on we had two JSRs. One was about modularity of the platform, and one was modularity of applications. And so I'm more interested in seeing the platform being modularized properly so that you can select, I want this bit and that bit, and have them well-defined as, as clearly separate modules, which you can then put together and say, this is my application. So especially for embedded applications, you don't want all of, you know, most people don't want Corba. So let's not include Corba in these kind of applications. And, but I agree that, you know, once you get into the idea of how do you modularize applications, there's a whole set of other, like, discussions that need to be had, and it's much, much harder. And then you bump into, like, well, why don't we just use OSGI and, and stuff like that? So what I really want to see is a nice, simple way of modularizing the Java platform and separating up the class libraries so we can say, I want, you know, logging, I want, you know, um, a bit of, like, UI maybe and, you know, some runtime stuff and, and whatever, and then put that together for your application. Much like that we've done with sort of, like, compact profiles but finer grained, rather than going for the full, let's do everything modular and creating a module architecture and then figuring out how to do dependencies and stuff like that. So I, I think that's my answer to that. So um, with that clarification, I do actually agree with him because um, I do think it's a good, a good thing to actually take a next step with compact profiles, modularize the JDK itself, but let's not leak the same thing into the language for application developers. Uh, modular, modularity is, to my, to, to my opinion, probably the most important thing if you, um, write, if you write code. But um, I mean, that's, that's a problem solved on many different levels already. And let's not leak it into the, into the language, so yeah. Yeah, I think the thing that prevents it from becoming a reality is the kind of level of unrealistic expectations that get added into this world. Anytime you say the word OSGI or modularity, people automatically assume that it's going to solve so many problems that really take a whole different level of concentration. Like, let's use a real world example. You could take a country and break it up into five smaller countries in a day by just renaming them. But to actually separate their systems out and make sure they can independently operate, that's, all, that's like another several years. And this is how modularity actually exists, which prevents these things from coming into reality because we need to kind of lower our expectations for what can be done so realize, yes, there's still more work. If we add modularity, you will not just magically get to plug anything into anything at any time. All right, so Garrett, so oh, last <coughs> in the round. Java 9. Everything's done what, already. So. No, what's so your number one feature you'd like to see in Java 9? Feature, it would be, um, however it is realized, using Jigsaw or whatever, I would love to see a compact profile using JavaFX without all the other stuff like AWT and all that swing thing, and add, it, add a web view and media support to that. Because for my, I'm just looking from the IoT point of view, okay. having a small device being able to display a website and also playing some audio, it's crucial. So compact, you need. compact profiles don't do it because it's too big when you include certain yeah, things you want. It has no JavaFX at the moment, so that's for me. But if you had like modularity and you could just pick and choose yes. the pieces you want. And it might make it possible to create a JVM that is only using JavaFX, media, the stuff that I need on an embedded device. Yeah. So however it is realized, but that would be something I would like to see in JDK9. You want to comment on that, Simon? Do I, do I get a vote too, or am I moderator? My vote doesn't count. I could still go through my list if you want, but go for it. I'm allowed to vote. All right, so, so I think I've, I've been mentioning this several times to, to Mark and Brian. I think they're getting tired of hearing me say this. <laughs> but my number one feature for, for Java 9 and beyond would be getting proper property support. And oh, Arun. Yes. <laughs> we have a thumbs up from our, our um, evangelist compatriots in other parts of the world. So I think this, this solves a, a, a class of problems. So whenever I mention this, the first question is what you mean by properties, and that, that needs to be defined. But I think it solves a, a whole set of class of problems. So for client people, it makes it much simpler to program to client APIs where you have observability and binding and you need property support. 
without having a Do extra you mean like, layer. Like Objective C property thing, where you can like get notified when things are updated. What do you mean by property? Okay, so that, that, that's we we have to define that. Um, but I think it also solves a class of Java EE problems as well. Where on the server side, you're you're constantly creating um, POJOs with you know get set methods for a whole bunch of stuff. And you're doing kind of ceremony around what you really want to say, which is I'm defining a data set. Got it. Totally. And there is, I think there's kind of two aspects to properties. One is the, the definition of a property, how you, how you like write in your code, I'm defining a property. And the other one is the usage of the property. So if I'm writing code that applies properties, what's the syntax look like? Do I have to do dot get dot set? or is there a convenient shortcut syntax? The, I think the client use case demands the, the latter. When you're using APIs, you want a very convenient syntax. The server use case demands the former. So you want a way to actually simplify the creation of like, you know, bojos and things which pr you know, provide data. Yeah, I can see that being very powerful. I, I don't know any app servers that don't have their own version of that in there already, which is a very strong sign we're really kind of at that edge of where we might want some standardization. I know yeah. a lot of people who are writing, you know, a lot of uh, back-end frameworks that, like, say, Facebook or whatever, and they all have their own flavor of property injection type of code that's completely separated from, like, things like Juice or whatever. It's just for properties. So everyone's thinking about this and doing it on uh, very so, so if you remember levels. the, go, go ahead, Simon. Well, I was going to say, and that, that to me is, is a clear indication that there's a need for that to be standardized. Because it's a whole thing of like, if you look at all the things we brought in, it's where people have, have solved the problem using open source frameworks and so on. So if people are doing that kind of thing already, then it's like, it must be time to bring it into Java and standardize it. We just need to make sure we do it the right way. Yeah. Agreed. The right way is always a, a another problem entirely. <laughs> yeah, three words which are very easy to say, but very difficult to actually do. <laughs> so, so, so my my request, I'm going to bundle it into one one request. I'm going to call it Project Coin Two. The <laughs> Project flip side, Coin Two. The flip side of the coin. <laughs> so, uh, I never underestimate is syntactic this the heads sugar. Heads or tails. Oh, that's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, would, I would love to see a bunch of stuff uh, added to, to still make the Java language less verbose. Um, the, I, I, I love the way other JVM languages um, try lots of funky stuff which we can pull into Java, because I don't think I want to see Java coming out and trialing all these different errors. And we can pull some of that back in. I know a lot of it is going to be tricky because of things like backwards compatibility. But I would love to see multi-line strings. I'd love to see st string interpolation without concatenation. So the ability to just drop, you know, I in your string, just to drop a, maybe a, a, a dollar variable name that you can just point to outside. Uh, I'd love to see um, parameter naming. I'd love to see default parameters. Uh, so, so w you know, it, it, you can effectively on a on a method signature, you can have a default for a parameter, which will entirely eliminate all this annoying method overloading where you have 100 methods, each of which call each other to get to one method which has the bulk of the code. Um, I'd love to see, I don't know if we have this in Java, I don't think we do, um, a, a type inference where we have a global variable, say, where we just have str as a string equals and then an actual string. I don't know if we have that. I think we might only have that for certain cases. I'd love to see things like that. Uh, what else? <laughs> yeah, so speaking of like a project coin effort, I think it's, it's good to point out that there actually is a standard process in the um, you open JDK now for putting changes in with Java enhancement proposals or JEPs, where you can propose a change, provide a template implementation for executing on that, and then it will, you know, if it's successful, it will get put into the appropriate release train. So they're they're moving to more of a train model where the dates are fixed, but as features are complete, they make it into the appropriate Java release. So that's kind of like how Project Coin was envisioned, right? A whole bunch of features where you had to provide an implementation, you had to make stuff happen. 
But now there's kind of a standard process for doing that going forward where you can put in ideas, you can make stuff happen um, through the JEP process. So I'll just submit Project Coin 2 and leave it at that. Right? <laughs> well, there's a couple linguistic things that on the note of multi-line strings, I would love to see that. Uh, you know, my, my, my other favorite language is Perl because it's the opposite of Java. And I, 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 I yeah, I, anyway. I have never written much in Perl, and when I have, I can't remember what I wrote, so I don't use it really in production or anything like that. But I would love in Java to be able to say return if, and then say a statement. You know, it would be nice to have all the returns on the left side, so I can see when my code is going to exit really cleanly, and so I can say return if this is no, or you know, very very simple statements like that. Uh, also, I'd like the ability if I have two classes that happen to have the same name and I want to use them in the same Java file, one of them has to be fully qualified. I would love to be able to just say import as. So if I've got a Jaxby object and an annotation with the same name, I can import one as that object XML. I mean, I can give it a, a local name and it would compile out. Real simple. And I'd love to be able to change the default scope of variables so all my variables are final by default, and I want to say that they're not <laughs> finable explicitly. And, and, and yeah, that's, that's a real sort of like, you know, uh, it, it's almost like a VI versus Emacs thing, isn't it? Because <laughs> I wouldn't want that. Yeah, right, well, exactly. Like we don't even have a mutable keyword, so we couldn't do that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But with all those features, I, I agree, by the way, but uh, with all those features, it's almost like asking um, standardized Groovy, make Groovy Java, or something like that. And actually, that I mean, uh, that, that sounds stupid, but um, it's actually a good thing. Um, in a language like Groovy, um, they can try out new language features quite freely because, well, it, they don't have a formal language specification like Java has. It's easier to move it around, but they can try, uh, try, try stuff out easily. Um, but we should... In, in Java, we should look at that, those kind of languages and uh, learn from it. And when something is proven to work, like multi-line strings, for example, uh, pull it into Java and make it a standard Java, Java feature. All right, so um, we're going to close out the panel now, if you guys are good. I think our panelists here have had to watch. You guys have dinner. So now it's a chance to let these guys have dinner. But let's give a big round of applause to the Java 8 release, which is now public. And I want to thank everyone here for being great audience members for our Java 8 panel and also watching the Java live stream. There will be a live band coming on in the next 15 minutes, so you can hang out here and enjoy the entertainment which is coming up. And we have... Go outside and get on the roller coasters. Oh, yeah. Roller coasters outside. Not trying to scare anyone out of the room. <laughs> That's where you're going to be, right, Marcus? The Java 8 roller coaster? Yes. So enjoy the theme park this evening, and I'll see you guys tomorrow for more interviews on the stage here. Simon. So, so I'd just like to say, I think it's going to be quite a lot of fun, actually. You go on the roller coaster having had several beers. <laughs> I'm not sitting next to you anymore. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Have a good night.